Welcome everyone to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar, Post Harvest Storage for Produce. I'm Jesse Schmidt and I work for the UVM Extension New Farmer Project. I'm going to be moderating this session. Our presenter today is Chris Callahan, UVM Extension Ag Engineer. Chris focuses on supporting the analysis, design, evaluation, and adoption of infrastructure and equipment that meets the needs of small scale food producers and processors. Chris enjoys working closely with farmers and others on multiple multidisciplinary projects that deliver practical, cost-effective, safe, and sustainable results. His areas of expertise include greenhouse energy efficiency and renewable energy, oilseed processing and farm-scale biodiesel production, harvest and post-harvest processing equipment and systems. Welcome, Chris. We're psyched to have you with us today. Thanks for having me, Jesse. This is uh, great to um, to be with you. and uh, it's. Uh, um, my, my, actually, my first time doing a webinar, so bear with me as uh, I, I learn the various tools here. I, I want to reinforce something Jesse said earlier. Please do use the chat box. Um, it's uh, the uh, one of the, I guess, one of the few ways I have to to get some uh, some immediate feedback from you. Um, I'd like to um, just start by uh, giving an outline of what I hope to cover. It, it, this is a fairly brief. Um, presentation uh, concerning post-harvest storage. I've been recently been doing a series of workshops around Vermont that um, we've actually been doing as uh, full day workshops and um, there's, there's a fair bit of detail involved in post-harvest practices, um, particularly storage and um, you know even at that uh, length of a presentation we, we still have uh, folks um, asking for more. So. Um, but this should give everybody a, at least an introduction to some, some um, considerations. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit of post-harvest basics. There's uh, some kind of fundamental information that uh, I think helps orient us all to uh, the, the idea of uh, storing produce and uh, fruits and vegetables. And um, We'll start there. I'm going to then take a look at four crops in particular that are very common uh, winter storage crops and carrots, onions, potatoes, and cabbage. And I like using these crops because they really demonstrate um, some of the uh, the important aspects that are involved in post-harvest storage uh, considerations. Then I'm going to take also a look at um, some different systems uh, that are available, and that's, that really is you know a combination of equipment and uh, controls, and then also talk a bit about monitoring. Um, at the end of the um, the PowerPoint portion of this, I, I do want to walk. Uh, I want I want you to um, want to introduce you to some web uh, resources that we've collected um, that others have found uh, to be valuable. But to get started, and um, let's just uh, to get everybody comfortable with the using the chat box and uh, interacting on the webinar. If you could all just enter you know, one or two words in the chat box that um, summarizes why uh, storage uh, is, is important to you and in, in, in your operation. Hey, it actually works. Look at that. So um, I'm just going to read some of the responses that I'm getting. Uh, food safety. Uh, Karen says food safety. Liz uh, wants to expand fall and winter share options at their farm. Tina, uh, extending fruit retail season. Hi, Tina. It's nice to see you. Uh, Tim Carroll, uh, keep things fresh before market the next day. So a little bit shorter term storage, but a great, uh, great reason. Beth wants to increase sales. Kimberly, to provide local veggies year-round. Um, Margiana, uh, market value. And uh, to keep product marketable. That's great. That really kind of sums it up. Um, yeah, another another way to think about it uh, is okay. So now we've we've grown something. Now what, right? And usually we're we're faced with we've grown it. Now we got to sell it. Um, and there is this intermediate step here of uh, not, not only post harvest rinsing or um, packing, but also storage. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And one of the key things. Um, from my perspective is by, by the time you've harvested a crop, almost all of your costs are sunk into that. So um, it really is a matter of how do we preserve that quality, uh, the quality of, the, of what you've grown and harvested and cared so carefully for. Um, 
and we want to, you know, how do we preserve the quality of that? And one of the key things is, is making sure we're paying attention to details and storage. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And the, the other aspect here is um, you certainly can store um, produce, what I'll say, I'll say suboptimally. Um, and, you know, we, we've done that for centuries. Um, and there's lots of good examples of very um, low-tech and, and um, um, solutions that, that work quite well. But there, there is this uh, uh, potential to really reduce waste in culling um, when you pack out of storage, for example. And um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the details involved there. Um, and then as a number of people have mentioned in, in the chat box, uh, this is an opportunity for both market and season expansion. Um, we're we're uh, seeing tremendous growth in our area in winter markets, um, the number of them as well as the number of uh, vendors and customers at them, um, as well as winter CSAs. Um, and it's another um, opportunity to uh, expand the season um, by storing rather than uh, or in addition to uh, winter growing. So I like to start with this uh, little cartoon that is um, a little dated, uh, but it's uh, as relevant now as it, as it was when it was first put out. Um, one of the key things I like to point out is when we harvest uh, produce and we are storing it, it's really important to remember that um, it is alive. It's still um, respiring and metabolizing. Um, Everything in storage is uh, still converting um, uh, sugars to uh, carbon dioxide and, and water. Um, and one of the ways, uh, and, and we want that to be the case, but we, do, we also want to slow that down uh, as much as possible so that we preserve the, uh, the food. And one of the ways we do that is with temperature um, by, by keeping uh, the, the produce at a, a an optimal temperature. At the same time, we also um, the uh, the produce can lose moisture. Bear with me a second. Let's see if I can find a. So we've talked about produce being alive. Sorry, produce being alive. And the other thing that happens is that we can lose moisture, and that's why it's important to have um, humidity controlled in storage. Um, we talked about respiration and metabolize, 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 metabolizing, and so you know that's the uh, these two items: the produce is breathing and it's releasing heat. Um, there is path there are pathogens in storage that we need to uh, be aware of, and I, I have some uh, resources uh, for everybody on that as well. And then of course uh, we can lose uh, what we're trying to store effectively. So stored crops are, are still alive, um, and um, this is a, an example of how a shelf life for sort of a generalized crop is um, affected by storage temperature. Um, there is this pretty, um, uh, pretty significant uh, bend in the curve um, below 50 degrees, and that's why a lot of our storage conditions are, um, are, are below that. And this varies um, by the crop, which we'll we'll talk about in a moment. Jesse, can you remind me how I get a pointer? Oh, there it is. Can everybody see that? So just remember you no, have I, I need to click. Yeah, there you go. Hold your. Uh, sorry, folks. All right. Um, so what what can happen in storage? Um, a lot of what we're trying to do is prevent tissue damage um, as a result of either chilling or freezing. Uh, some of this can can happen because of say mechanical damage during uh, harvest uh, or during uh, rinsing or packing. Um, it can also vary over the body of the of the plant, and so one of the things we want to always be looking for is um, uh, this, the signs of this of this uh, injury or damage and um, make sure that it's not a result of uh, the storage conditions, the temperature or humidity. Um, there's also uh, an interesting thing that happens with produce where the minimum storage temperature is not the same as the um, typical freezing temperature we associate with water. A lot of um, 
um, crops can are ideally stored at at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which uh, normally would would freeze water. But because of the the composition of of the plant and uh, the fact that it's still um, metabolizing, uh, we're uh, we're not going to freeze it. Um, the other thing that can happen is uh, desiccation or drying. Um, remember, we're we're keeping things cool using cold air, and uh, cold air does tend to be dry air, um, particularly because of the way we we usually uh, get it. We 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 produce cold air oftentimes using refrigeration, and uh, we we do that by uh, using a relatively cold refrigerant, which has the effect of drying air out much like your, uh, the, the benefit, if you will, we get from air conditioning uh, in those, those really humid summer days. Um, there's also heat that's, that comes about from that respiration of the, of the plant, and that can create local spots of relatively high temperature in, for example, a bulk bin. Um, but it can also be advantageous for us. Uh, for example, when storing squash in an uh, insulated room, Oftentimes, you can get away with maintaining that squash at its optimal 50 degree temperature without adding any additional heat because it does produce its own. Um, we also get moisture. I mentioned that because of respiration, uh, we do get moisture uh, from, from the uh, product. And that, will, that can be beneficial, as I'll show you, uh, when we start to look at specific storage conditions. So we, we need humidity in the air, um, and we're going to talk about that in terms of RH, or relative humidity. The other thing to keep in mind is that ethylene is a, um, a chemical. It's a chemical that has the effect of uh, it's essentially a ripening hormone uh, in plants. Um, various plants are sensitive to it at different levels. Um, and the various plants produce it at different levels. So um, most folks may, uh, may be familiar with the, the idea of keeping apples uh, in a separate space from, say, carrots. Uh, apples are um, notorious producers of ethylene as they ripen and, uh, in storage. And carrots are particularly sensitive to ethylene, um, has the effect of bittering them. Uh, so it's important to keep those two separate. What's not so obvious uh, is, um, and in some, of, some instances of um, you know, site visits I've had with growers in Vermont, for example, who are storing lots of carrots, is uh, carrots are also producers of ethylene. They, they produce it at low levels, um, but uh, they can have the, that can have the effect of self-bittering the carrots uh, if you're not able to provide enough air exchange and ventilation in the storage space. So. Um, we want to uh, keep that in mind as we consider storage um, spaces and what we put in with other things, but also uh, the amount of space we have around those things for ventilation. Um, and so we've talked about the need to pay attention to temperature and uh, relative humidity um, in, our, in our storage space and to be concerned about ethylene, um, both as a uh, as it's produced by different crops, but also as crops are sensitive to it. Um, and at this point, I guess I'd like to ask everybody to just type in a few of the crops um, that they're most um, interested in storage uh, and in storing. So if you can use the chat box again, just let me know what, what folks are growing and planning to store. So I see beets, garlic, winter squash, potatoes, garlic, potatoes, garlic, carrots, potato, garlic, squash, carrots, onions, apples, kiwi, pears, Asian pears, persimmons, uh, potatoes, sweet potatoes, basil, thyme, sage, sweet potatoes, beets, carrots, carrots, winter squash, onions. So a lot of these uh, things are winter storage crops um, and greens for a limited time, a few weeks. Okay. Uh, sorry, tomatoes and squash and celeriac. Great. Thanks, everybody, for participating. That's awesome. Um, the, uh, one of the best references we have for understanding what conditions we should be storing things at is the USDA Handbook 66 that's pictured here in its print form. 
uh, which actually it hasn't been printed since 1986. Um, here at UVM, we actually continue reprinting this on our own um, to have a uh, a print version available. But I'm going to take a second and let's see here if I can do this. I want to take you to a website. Is everybody able to see this? Um, we able to do the, the checkbox? Looks good. Okay, thanks, Jesse. Um, so this is uh, my blog page. It's blog.uvm.edu slash cwcallah. Um, and if you go to crop storage resources on the left-hand side, this is a collection of resources that we've put together as, as a result of this workshop series we're doing. Um, and I've got some organization to do on this. Um, I tend to know where everything is, but it's probably not so straightforward for everybody else to find it. So bear with me as we, it's a, it's a working process and uh, we're going to improve it. But one of the things, um, one of the sections here is conditions and practices. And the first link is USDA Handbook 66. So if we click on that, it brings us to um, the USDA, uh, the online version of the USDA Handbook 66. Yes, I'll paste the link in. Bear with me. Uh, someone's asking if I, and then here is the link for Handbook 66. Sorry about that. Um, um, the uh, so this is the online version of Handbook 66, and I'm sorry, it opened in a different window. Bear with me. There, um, and at the front section of this is a lot of uh, sort of generalized background on um, storage, uh, post-harvest practices, um, respiratory uh, metabolism, for example, what what the actual uh, biology is that's going on during metabolism. But as we scroll down, we see there are uh, crop-specific summaries. So there was a lot of garlic mentioned in the chat box. So I'm going to go look at garlic, and what we end up with here is a PDF um, that's all about uh, the post-harvest um, storage of garlic. Um, and the other thing we have is a, um, a name, a contact at UC Davis, uh, who is a, uh, the topic expert on storing garlic. And as we go through here, um, in addition to um, things like um, pre-cooling practices and, and how to cure garlic. Uh, we also are presented with the optimum storage conditions for garlic. Um, and garlic is one where uh, there's a highly variable practice uh, in terms of how people store it. Uh, some people never get it to um, never get it to a low temperature, for example, for storage. They they uh, they keep it at a relatively high temperature and and avoid that um, the uh, uh, the, the impact of the cold, um, which leads to if you then have a, 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 a temporary rise in temperature, the garlic might start to sprout. Uh, so, but this is uh, general general guidelines um, for uh, for storage. Also, gets into things like controlled atmosphere, which um, not many uh, small or diversified growers uh, practice. Um, but it also gets into, for example, the ethylene uh, production of garlic and sensitivity. And in this case, garlic um, produces very low amounts of ethylene and is not particularly sensitive. So um, lot, lots of good information here on this specific crop. And at the very end, if this isn't enough information for you on, on the crop of interest, you can get into even more detail by looking at some of the references. So this is um, what I've done on this next slide is take uh, the information out of the um, Handbook 66 for four common crops that people are interested in, carrots, onions, potatoes, and cabbage, <coughs> excuse me, and put it in a table form. And what I like about this is it, it, it stresses the, um, some of the differences in storage conditions for quote unquote optimal storage. If we look at carrots, for example, versus potatoes, these are both root vegetables and oftentimes we 
uh, we think, well, they can be stored at, in, in common spaces. And, and they can, but optimally, spe you know, speaking of optimal storage, carrots want to be at a lower temperature than potatoes, um, despite the fact that they, they both want to be at high uh, relative humidities, right? Um, and then the other thing that I've um, seen uh, in practice is potatoes and onions being stored together. And in that case, um, not only are the temperatures quite different, but look at the relative humidity guideline for onions. Uh, we're looking for a relatively dry room, 65 to 70 uh, percent relative humidity, and potatoes want to be uh, much higher. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting to look at is the ethylene production rate. And the, the specific units on this um, are, are not particularly uh, handy for, for most people, and it, it's okay. The key thing to remember is none of these are zero. Um, so everything produces a certain amount of ethylene, and um, they can have an effect. For example, carrots are highly sensitive to ethylene, um, as is cabbage. And so if we store these in a sealed up container uh, without, you know, so say we put carrots in a, in a non-perforated bag, um, there, is, um, there is good uh, science as well as anecdotal evidence that suggests it's going to lead to bittering because of this high ethylene sensitivity and the fact that it's a producer itself. Any questions at the moment? Just throw them in the chat box if you have something. I see somebody writing something. Um, Jesse, can you comment on how the slides will be handled following the webinar? Um, so the the previous slide uh, demonstrated the 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 need for uh, optimally speaking with the need for different zones and. You know, first first impressions on that would be, oh no, now I need to build not only just one storage uh, can, uh, room, but multiple storage rooms. And it, for larger volume production, that that is probably best from an operational efficiency perspective. But you can also accomplish uh, zone storage using fairly low cost and um, low tech solutions. You know, perforated bags work wonderfully for, uh, for example, providing a high humidity environment for carrots um, or even potatoes. Um, you can use vapor barrier walls uh, in, say, say you have one uh, cooler that uh, is, is cooled by a, a cool bot, for example. You can um, have a uh, vapor barrier wall with just some perforations in it um, to uh, separate two zones, for example, one with high humidity and one with low. And yes, ultimately you, you can certainly build dedicated structures for the, the purpose of having different storage conditions. Um, the other thing I like to point out is some crops have very um, strict needs for uh, pre-cooling. Um, so once harvested, getting them to storage temperature as soon as possible, um, either uh, because you, you want to preserve quality or because your uh, customers are demanding it, for example. Um, and that may, that may suggest a need for a, um, a dedicated zone for pre-cooling or for sizing your, your refrigeration system to do that in addition to holding products at temperature. So when we talk about a uh, cold room, uh, we're really talking about removing heat. Um, you know, we have uh, removing heat or um, um, uh, yeah, removing heat either from the product itself or um, the, the heat gained from outside, for example, storing uh, something at 35 degrees when it's 80 degrees outside. Um, there's a question in the chat box, are there techniques for removing ethylene from the room? Yes, it's um, generally done by um, one of two ways, uh, either air exchange, which is to say ventilation of, of the room, which can be accomplished really just um, generally is accomplished by um, door openings through normal practice. Going in and out of the room to pack product in or pack it out will allow for some air exchange. Um, it, this, it, you want to make sure that there is sufficient room around the stored product inside the room so that uh, that air does get mixed uh, fairly well. Um, you can have dedicated ventilation fans as well. If let's say you, you have a large potato storage room or carrot storage room, um, 
that you're not going in and out of very frequently, maybe once a week, you may want to have some dedicated ventilation in there to do that job. Rule of thumb is three to five air changes per day uh, for the space. Um, so root cellaring is something that's been done for years. It's essentially what we're doing is um, you know, getting below grade and using that relatively cool or stable temperature of the ground to um, keep our product at a stable temperature. Um, and then it also has the added benefit of being a, a source of humidity for the crop. Um, air exchange is something that also has been used uh, successfully for um, benefiting, for example, from co the cool outside air uh, when we have something we're trying to keep cool inside. Um, and that's a, really a matter of having a fan that exchanges the, the air outside with the air inside. And it can be either manually controlled or you can put it on thermostatic controls using um, a refrigeration or heating thermostat. And then the most common um, method of removing heat is mechanical refrigeration using you know what we all generally refer to as a cooler. I uh, include in mechanical refrigeration cool bots and more conventional uh, systems, uh, which we'll talk about next. Oh, and then I should say also some crops need to be kept at relatively high temperatures, uh, 50, to, uh, 50 degrees, for example, for uh, most winter squashes. And so oftentimes that's a separate zone or even a separate room which has some sort of heater in it. So a quick overview of refrigeration. Um, it, th this, uh, this same um, schematic, if you will, is equally relevant to a uh, window air conditioner, a refrigerator in your home, um, a dehumidifier, um, or uh, you know, the air conditioner in your car, as well as a commercial refrigeration system. And at the heart of it is a compressor. The compressor is what we use to actually in, put energy into the system and it heats up refrigerant. What's inside this tube that goes all the way around the system is refrigerant. And the refrigerant has a great little property associated with it. It boils at a very low temperature. Um, in fact, that's why we call the evaporator, that's the um, piece of equipment that sits inside your cooler, we call that the, the evaporator because it's boiling or evaporating the refrigerant. And it does that at, say, 26 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's what enables us to get the air to a low temperature. So the compressor is um, pumping, pumping that uh, refrigerant up to a high pressure. It heats it up. And uh, this is still a gas. Anywhere in this where you see dotted uh, dots, are, the refrigerant is a gas. Um, and so it goes through the condenser, which is outside the, the cooler. Um, and it's um, because the refrigerant is hot, hotter than the air outside, hotter than the air outside, it condenses. Uh, it gives up heat to the air and it condenses back into a liquid and it's being pumped through this line and through what we call an expansion valve, which reduces the pressure again and makes it so the refrigerant can boil at that low temperature we were talking about before. So we're benefiting in a refrigeration system from the phase change of a refrigerant and the key thing to remember is refrigerant has this really neat um, property that allows it to boil at low temperatures. To put this sort of in context, you've probably all seen evaporator units in walk-in coolers. That's what they look like in, in reality. And this is the part that, um, they, that they rep that's represented in, in the schematic here. And compressor condensers are generally sitting up high outside and um, they look like this. You have a heat exchanger. Um, and then the compressor itself is this, usually this black domed um, item right in the center. And there's lots of copper pipe for the refrigerant to flow uh, into and out of the room. There are some options um, if uh, folks are considering um, uh, more conventional uh, refrigeration coolers uh, and uh, with respect to evaporators. I talked before about how um, the refrigerant is boiling at a ver very low temperature, say 26, 28 degrees Fahrenheit. That has the effect of uh, bringing the air, so air is, is being uh, brought through this evaporator within the cooler. That air is brought, brought down to a, that temperature, or nearly so, and the effect of that is to dry it out. That's why these all have little drains in them. You've probably seen these in walk-in coolers. Um, the, the, liquid water coming off of that drain is water that's been dropped out of the air. We mentioned earlier 
that we actually want fairly high relative humidity in some of our storage zones. And so these evaporators can work against you when you're trying to do that. Um, one option is what's called a high humidity evaporator. Um, it's only, um, it's a couple hundred dollars more for a typical, uh, say, 10 by 10 walk-in cooler um, to get a high humidity evaporator. Um, but it's an option to discuss with uh, your refrigeration contractor if you are considering a, 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 um, a prefab cooler. Um, I want to talk quickly about CoolBots. I am guessing there are folks who are interested in CoolBots. Um, go ahead and say yes or no on the uh, chat box or the voting buttons. Just give me a sense. Not really. Yes, yes, yes. See them commonly used. Yeah. Okay. So, great. Some folks have them. Great. Um, so there is some interest. Uh, CoolBots are a um, a controller, a special design controller that was invented by a, uh, a farmer. Um, and what they do is they tr essentially trick a uh, a window air conditioner into um, running um, more, uh, running longer, and um, driving the air temperature lower than they normally do. Um, anybody who has an air conditioner probably knows that we, we, we generally don't run them down to 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So what this controller does is um, it senses the temperature of your cold room. Um, you tell it what temperature you want it to be at. Um, and is, if the temperature inside the room is higher than that, it heats the thermal couple that um, controls the air conditioner and forces it to come on. So um, the key, one of the key things is remember the, this is only going to work as good as the insulated box that you've built. Um, this insulated box may look a little rough around the edges, but it's actually quite well insulated and quite well sealed. And those are the key things. You can see the spray foam around the uh, air conditioner so there's no leakage. Um, the insulation here are providing a good thermal barrier. Um, I'm also going to put in the, uh, hang on, go to the next slide first. Um, I'm going to put the link here in the uh, chat box for the uh, information on the CoolBot. If you just search for CoolBot, you will get there as well. Um, the website is very informative. Um, the um, manufacturer is quite transparent about what their product is good for and what it is not good for. Um, and they want to see it used successfully. Some of the, the key um, things that it has going for it is it's, it's a very low initial cost uh, refrigerated uh, space option. Um, it's easy to retrofit into existing spaces. Um, if you have some basic construction skills, uh, you, can, you can build a cold room and uh, an insulated box and get a, a, a cool bot up and running fairly quickly. Um, there is a reported potential ben efficiency benefit. I'm going to speak to that in just a moment. Um, because I, I don't necessarily agree with that uh, myself. Um, there are some downsides. It can be slow to pull down temperature, in other words, uh, to use, use this as a pre-cooling uh, option um, uh, for, for produce. Uh, it may be, may be difficult um, to get the, the pre-cooling times that you're, you're after. Uh, it's also slow, so it's for the same reason, slow to recover from rises in temperature within the, the room. Um, these are, are ideally suited for holding something at temperature once it's there. So um, and the other uh, downside is it uh, cools really to 35 degrees. That's sort of the minimum temperature that um, the uh, manufacturer um, is, is um, supportive of. The, uh, the question of uh, energy efficiency has been studied uh, by, uh, by a NYSERDA contractor. Um, Kelsey says your cool buck gets down to 32 degrees. Um, that's interesting. How, how have you measured it, Kelsey? Okay, with a thermometer. Um, it's it it may be um, that the I I would question that measurement. Um, we can talk a little bit more um, afterward if you like. Uh, because if you're getting this down to 32, um, it's it, that's sort of uh, I would worry a little bit about first of all reliability of the cool bot. But let, let's chat a little bit um, after we get through the rest of this. Um, in the 
And in an ICERTA study, they looked at an 8 by 10 storage room um, using all the New York conditions. And uh, the, um, the cooling to 35 degrees Fahrenheit and comparing it with what I'll call a conventional refrigeration system. Um, and the savings they saw it when compared to a conventional system with evaporative fans, uh, fan controls, um, was about $10 a year um, in favor of the conventional system, whereas for the cool bot, it, um, the cool bot benefited when, uh, or, out, or won when the, um, the conventional system did not have evaporator fan controls. But the difference was in the you know, $10 or $30 a year range. The real benefit here comes in the initial cost. The cool bot costs about $750 dollars net of the cold room in each case, whereas a conventional system is uh, several thousand dollars. A couple of questions here on, in the chat box. Uh, seems like a pre-cooling room uh, is important to use with cool bots. Yes, so uh, some sort of pre-cooling um, would be beneficial when using a cool bot, um, whether that's uh, you know, planning the harvest of the, the product coming in um, for a cool day leading into a cool night. So maybe you, you leave it um, outside uh, so it, it, it cools down sort of using amb the ambient temperature prior to going into the, the cold room. Um, the, the, um, the effect of putting in um, not pre-cooled uh, product into that cold room uh, would be to raise the temperature of everything else that's already in there. So we would like to avoid that if possible. Karen Scott asks, uh, use hydrocooling to pre-cool. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a practice that is um, widely used for many different crops. Um, hydrocooling is the, the idea of using cool, cooled water. Uh, you, you know, so, uh, the simplest form of this is rinsing. Um, you know, you, when you, uh, you can remove a fair bit of uh, field heat just by um, doing a good job of rinsing the product prior to it going into storage yeah, for, product, for um, crops that can be rinsed. Uh, when you are building your good, quote, unquote, good box, what are the moisture considerations? Good question, Kimberly. Um, the, uh, the, guide, the guidance here is to use a, uh, a smooth, cleanable surface on the inside that's well sealed. So some of the common materials used, um, better materials used would be like FRP, what we call dairy board, fiber reinforced plastic. Uh, there are two varieties of that out there, class A and class C, I believe. And um, for they, they differ by their fire rating. And for most applications that we're talking about, you can get the cheaper one, which is about seven bucks a sheet, uh, which is the class C. Um, you can also use um, wood products as long as they are uh, sealed on the, the finished side with a, a high quality exterior paint. Um, I uh, tend, to, tend to favor Luon, which is a quarter inch uh, underlayment. It has a very uh, relatively tight grain that um, I think finishes more smoothly when painted than, for example, uh, plywood. Um, particle board for, is a very um, popular uh, construction material, I think um, it should be avoided as much as possible in storage rooms just because it does end up with the, that rather coarse surface and that can be, uh, those nooks and crannies are uh, nice homes for uh, moisture loving um, uh, pathogens that we want to have, uh, we want to avoid in storage. Um, other moisture considerations would be, you know, drainage of, um, of the drainage, drainage in the floor so that when you do clean um, clean the inside of it, you're able to get rid of that bulk um, moisture. Um, there are times when we need to add humidity to the air, um, and uh, you're welcome, Kimberly. Uh, there are times when we need to add humidity to the air. Um, oh, one other thing, sorry, on uh, sealing and moisture considerations. Um, any of the corners, um, you know, where the walls meet the floor, for example, or where walls meet each other, make sure those are sealed as well, um, you know, both insulated uh, with, with um, uh, gap-filling uh, foam, but also, uh, you know, use a silicone um, uh, caulk or something in the corner where your finished uh, layer meets, meet each other to avoid moisture getting in behind um, that space. So getting back to um, adding humidity to the space, uh, moist slabs are a very common thing that's used. Um, in other words, putting uh, liquid water on a, um, on a concrete slab. Many people use moist uh, burlap or cloth blankets. 
we generally want to avoid a direct contact of liquid water with the product, if at all possible, um, once we're in storage. Uh, what we're trying to do is make for a moist, um, humid environment of air around the product, but not have a lot of direct liquid contact. Um, there are some more advanced options available that are called foggers or nozzles, um, and they're fairly expensive, um, you know, on the order of several thousand dollars uh, to do the job. In higher moisture, sorry, higher temperature environments like potatoes, for example, where we're looking at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, that's well away from freezing, really, and relative, high relative humidity, you could use something like a room uh, humidifier. Um, a small little room humidifier. Um, they have models available now that um, uh, that um, have no moving parts, so that's something that's uh, nice from a reliability perspective. Karen, I see your question. Can a simple humidifier be used? Yes. Um, I just want to talk briefly about controls. Um, one of the things I see when I'm out and about in, in the field, every uh, uh, cooler I walk into, I do a temperature check on, and um, I'm finding that thermostats are often 7 to 12 degrees, um, in, in, have 7 to 12 degrees of inaccuracy. That comes from a couple different things. One is, you know, a lot of them have these knobs for setting temperatures, and the range on these things is so wide that it makes it difficult to really get a good, precise setting. Um, you don't know if you're at 32 degrees or 36 degrees, for example. The other thing I find is they're just, they're just inaccurate. Um, and so that's not a lost cause. It doesn't mean you need to replace your thermostat. But knowing uh, what the actual temperature is in the space is very important. And I'll have some ideas for, for that in just a minute. Um, the other thing I um, tend to suggest is go with a digital um, thermo uh, thermostat. It's not that they're necessarily more accurate, but they do offer you precision in setting. Uh, you can set your thermostat um, more uh, more specifically, and they also um, they have these remote uh, sensing. Um, th this is a bulb, and this is a thermocouple. Um, so I just said that uh, thermostats tend to be inaccurate. So so what are we going to do? Well, I, I'm a big fan of having a known good um, measurement plan, and I use something called a sling psychrometer. And what this is is two therm two thermometers on a um, uh, it, that's, that actually swings around uh, what's being held here. And one of the, they're, they're identical thermometers, except one has this little uh, uh, cotton wick that's around the bulb of it. Um, and that gets moistened with water. And when you swing this sling psychrometer around, the bulb that has the moistened water around it um, starts to evaporate water into the air. And it's able to evaporate at a rate that's dictated by the relative humidity of the air. And so what we end up with is dry bulb temperature on the dry bulb and wet bulb temperature on the wet bulb. And I'm not sure if anybody's heard those terms before, but that's how we determine relative humidity is by comparing the, the dry bulb temperature to the wet bulb temperature. Um, this, uh, believe it or not, it really is still the, the sort of gold standard for measuring temperature and humidity. And those are two things we're, we're really interested in if we're talking about um, post-harvest storage. Um, so this is a, uh, about a $30 item. Uh, a company called QA Supplies uh, has a, a couple different options um, available for you to consider. Um, you also can get, for example, a calibrated wall-mounted um, combined uh, uh, hygrometer. Uh, thermostat. So this has humidity on the blue scale and temperature on the red scale. And this is um, a, actually a little more expensive than this. This is about an $80 um, item, but it is calibrated, so you know it's coming in with a, a good, accurate um, uh, measurement. So uh, Karen has asked, what is it called again? The, the item down here is called a sling psychrometer. Um, Psychrometry is the um, study of um, water vapor in air. I'll put a link on uh, in a minute uh, for um, sources of these two things. It's a company called QA Supplies, um, but I don't have the link handy. Bear with me. Um, you can also do um, the, the other key key uh, part of this is you want to want to monitor and record your conditions um, to see if there's any trends in them. Um, you know, is your temperature Thank you, Jesse, for putting QA supplies there. Is your temperature changing over time? Um, is your humidity changing over time? And that can help you determine whether you need to add more humidity or if you need to um, take a look at your, your cooling or heating. Um, 
I'm running up against 45 minutes and we're nearly done, so that's, that's good. That'll leave us some time for questions. Um, I did also want to put a plug in for scouting. Um, everybody who's growing is probably intimately familiar with scouting for um, pests and diseases while, while you're growing. Um, I'm sorry to say it doesn't stop with storage. Um, so we want to do daily checks for spoilage or sprouting of crops. Um, it's also a good idea to have some pe different people perform the task. Uh, we, we do sort of become blind to certain things as we do it um, routinely, and it might be nice to vary it up a little bit. Um, and when pulling stored crops, check, uh, check other bins, and uh, again, checking for spoilage and sprouting. And use all five senses. Uh, you may not see the problem, but you may smell it or feel it for example, and not a bad idea to taste your product once in a while. Um, one of the uh, most recent stories I have is, again, related to carrots. Um, uh, people, uh, this, um, this one grower had some leftover non-perforated bags, put their carrots in those, uh, one, one batch of carrots in those, and stored them in their cooler, and then had uh, another batch in perforated bags, um, not, and they were, they were harvested the same day, cleaned the same day, and then put in storage. The only difference being the two bags, and uh, by tasting uh, carrots from each of those, we were able to determine that the carrots that were in the non-perforated bags were bittering very quickly compared to the other ones. It's also important to scout the mechanicals, the, uh, the cooler components, for example. The, um, you want to look for, for uh, any daylight uh, sneaking through when the doors are closed. Uh, make sure the latches are closing uh, tightly. If you see um, on your condenser, even in the CoolBot applications, you see a lot of uh, dust uh, collecting on the, on the heat exchangers. That, that's got to get cleaned off. Uh, the other thing I like to point out is noise is energy. If you hear uh, some, you know, these things are not quiet, we know that, but if you hear a change in the noise uh, coming from your, your refrigeration system, that usually suggests that something has changed and we want to have that addressed. I want to summarize, uh, I'll leave this, the list of technical references up for, for you all. Um, these are some things that I, I use as references on a regular basis. The, um, I use my own blog, believe it or not. I use that as a place to collect useful links. Um, so I'd suggest uh, taking a peek at that, including the, the crop resources uh, page we talked about earlier. Handbook 66 is available online, as we mentioned. The New England Vegetable Management Guide um, it covers crops in uh, sort of a broader scope from um, planting and agronomy and uh, cultural practices, but there are some post-harvest uh, considerations provided there as well. I didn't get into the UC Davis post-harvest website uh, very uh, much at all today, but um, that's another great um, resource for crop-specific uh, information, including post-harvest diseases. Um, and psychrometric charts and calculators, when using, um, if, you, if you, anybody gets into using a sling psychrometer and you have dry bulb and wet bulb as uh, data that you, you, know, you read off of these, these uh, thermometers, you can go to, um, go to a, um, a psychrometric calculator and determine all sorts of information about that air, um, like relative humidity, for example. Um, so I'm going to open it up for questions at this point. Jesse, do you have anything you wanted to add? Well, first of all, I just want to say thanks, Chris. This has been an excellent presentation, a lot of information packed into a short time. Um, if people need to uh, check yeah. out now and get on to other things, um, feel free. If you have some uh, questions, um, please tap, type them into the chat box. We do have um, five or ten minutes here set aside for specific questions. Um, and also, I did put the uh, survey link in the webinar um, chat room there and uh, would love to get your feedback. It, it really is helpful to us. Um, also, yes, the webinar is going to be recorded. We encourage you to put your email into the chat box, or if you fill out that survey, um, you can put your email in there. We can send you follow-up information, including a link to the recording, as well as a PDF of the presentation slides. So give us a way to contact you, and uh, we'll get that information to you. Um, so any, looks like lots of people are checking out. Um, lunch hour is over. Uh, if you have questions, uh, pop them in, in the chat box, too. Uh, Liz asks, any low-tech recommendations for keeping a cooler humid? Um, 
some of the the most common practices I see are uh, wetting um, floor spaces, for example, by um, pouring water on them, and that's that's an acceptable practice. The the one thing to be careful of there is to make sure that your product is actually stored, you know, let's say six inches off of the floor, so on uh, pallets or on racks, for example. Um, again, we're trying to minimize direct contact of water with the product. Um, again, you can use moistened burlap bags um, draped over. Um, uh, storage uh, pallet bins, for example, uh, taking care to make sure, again, that we don't have direct contact. Um, you know, any, any moist surface becomes uh, sort of a, uh, um, a vector for pathogens. All right. Well, I think um, uh, we are all set here. So, Chris, again, thanks. Um, it was great to have you. And uh, just a plug for our next webinar. Uh, it will be the third Thursday in November. Um, it's going to be focused on an introduction to raising rabbits for commercial meat production. So anybody interested in that, check back in to our webinar page, um, and you'll find information there about that upcoming webinar. Uh, so thanks again, and have a good rest of the day, everybody. See ya. Thanks, Jess.